How great is the love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Amen. What have we got for our consideration today are words of the prophet Isaiah, as I had announced earlier, chapter 62. We begin reading at verse 1. I will not keep silent because of Zion, and I will not keep still because of Jerusalem, until her righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be given a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. You will be a a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God's hand. You will no longer be called deserted, and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you will be called, my delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land will be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you, and as a groom rejoices over his bride... So your God will rejoice over you. This is God's word. Brothers and sisters in Christ, people often ask me what they should call me. We live in an age in which uh, titles, maybe even over the last 10 to 20 years, have kind of faded in importance or sometimes almost acceptability. When I first got into the ministry uh, some 30 years ago, uh, almost without exception, people referred to me as Pastor Veets. And then as some time went by, people didn't like, some of them anyway, didn't like the, the formal sound of that, so they substituted my first name for my last name, and then I became Pastor John. And then for some others still, especially those who became uh, more familiar with me and, and, and friends. They got rid of the title altogether, and to them, I was just John. The transition seems to reflect a, uh, a transition from uh, understanding of that relationship as being more professional, if you will, to more personal. Now, To tell you the truth, I really don't care one way or the other about such things. People have called me many things through the years, some of them good. When I was a little boy in grade school, some of my grade school friends for a while referred to me as Dorito because I always had them in my lunch. In the neighborhood where I grew up, some of them called me Flossie, which was short for philosopher, Uh, because it seemed they accused me of always wanting to pontificate about ideas of intellectual interest. They were just teasing. They weren't being mean, mostly. When I was in high school, my roommate dubbed me Johnny Cakes, which got shortened to Cakes, and there are pastors in the Wisconsin Senate, if they see me, who will still address me in that way today. During the Epiphany season, we are following the uncovering or the revelation of Jesus, who is our God, and the work that he came to do. And in the gospel lesson that we read a few moments, the wedding at Cana, we see, we see him uncovering his, his goodness, his grace, his kindness on that uh, family for whom he turned the water into wine. Here in Isaiah, as I had announced earlier, the the prophet takes up the, the, the language of marriage and weddings in order to describe God's goodness towards us and in us. He is uncovering who God is, if you will, and what he does for us and especially his great goodness and mercy, but in a different way, using us as the examples of it, showing himself by the 
changes he's made in our hearts and then expressing the place that we have in his heart. This is a part of the epiphany we really don't discuss much. God's holding forth of his people themselves as examples of the kind of God he is by what he has brought into their lives and made of them. And today, through Isaiah's words to the prophet, we see that a part of this work, in in order to express this way, the Lord gives new names to his people. The Lord gives new names to his people to put their righteousness on display and to express his delight in them. There is a a purpose for the new names that God gives to his people in this section. He he wants to use them as a, a way to show off to show off the changes that he has brought about in them. I will not keep silent because of Zion, and I will not keep still because of Jerusalem until her righteousness shines like a bright light and her salvation like a flaming torch. Nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. You will be given a new name that the Lord's mouth will announce. You will be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your, Lord's, of your God's hand. There's an ad that keeps coming up in my Facebook news feed from time to time. It is promoting a video class that teaches couples how to dance. And it is called Show Her Off. The, the, the dancing in the video isn't suggestive or provocative in some way, but it certainly makes the female in the couple the star of the show. The, 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 the moves that are made are, 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 are done in such a way as, uh, as if to have the, 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 the man in the couple say, this is my wife or girlfriend. Do you see how beautiful she is? I am proud to be her partner. As a man takes her through twirls and dips as they dance along the way. Now, in the prophet Isaiah, God isn't dancing with us, but it is it's hard to miss, isn't it, from his message that he wants to show us off. You are what he wants to show to the world as a way of describing and showing his own goodness and grace uh, through the process. He wants to put our righteousness on display, he says, so that it shines like a bright light and our salvation, like a flaming torch. Well, understand, that's not because uh, we look so impressive in our own righteousness in the first place that uh, attracted him to us. it's, uh, It's clear that if he wants to show off our salvation, that that meant that there was something bad there we had to be saved from. Is that hard to believe? Is that hard to accept? Our sin was not uh, just a little imperfection. that We needed a boost to be able to get through. It's not just a minor weakness that gets a little bit of his uh, help and attention and then we're through on the other side. No, he had to come and he had to save us. He had to rescue us from it entirely. The problem wasn't one isolated sin that keeps tripping us up, although there may be one particular sin in our lives that does keep tripping us up. But the greater problem lies in the entire moral effort, the the lifelong project of, uh, of trying to obey his will and live according to what he wants, the the, the cold and faithless heart, the, the stubborn and, and, and broken will that does not want what God wants and that will not let us pursue it. That has left us spiritually spent 
and helpless. Or to, to use another picture, it's not as though we were the patient that the doctor had to give a surgery or prescribe some medicine to make us better. We were like the dead accident victim that the doctor had to bring back to life. But the doctor has brought us back to life all the way. The Lord has given us a real righteousness, not the stained and, and tainted kind that would have been produced by ourselves by our own efforts as we tried to make our own contribution to good and moral behavior, but the righteousness of Jesus. That perfect love, that flawless uh, mercy and obedience that he offered to God at all times, given to us as our very own. Our salvation was not a do-it-yourself project. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get yourself out of trouble. But God has saved us and rescued us by Jesus' death in our place for our sins at the cross and by his resurrection from the dead, which is ushering us into uh, and, and promising us free passage to life that never ends. That makes you and me the kind of people God can show off that great change that he has worked in our lives. This gives us the kind of righteousness that he can put up on display. You know, you know b believers are no longer the kind of people who, who glory in their shame, to borrow an expression from the Apostle Paul, uh, the, the kind of people who, whose great pride is in the fights that they have won and the fools that they have cheated and the conquests that they've made in the bedroom and the that the complete leave they at times have taken of their senses in some wild partying because of too much to drink or what they injected into themselves or what pill they took. No. Nor is their glory found in their own moralistic, self-righteous moments when they have acted just a little holier than their less sanctified friends or acquaintances, there may be nothing uglier than the religious person who thinks that they have spiritually arrived. It is the broken sinner who admits their helplessness and need and receives and embraces and clings to God's grace and mercy. that shows what our God is like and the great change that he has made. That puts a real righteousness on display. Only this faith and hope in Christ will then be a glorious crown in the Lord's hand and a royal diadem in the palm of your God's hand. You know, we don't live in royalty in our country, under royalty in our country, do we? Uh, I, I think we watch the Europeans sometimes and we're happy for that. When we, when we see a crown or a picture of a crown, uh, our minds may not take us much beyond the precious metals and the jewels that go into it. It's, it's something that's uh, for the wealthy. It's a matter of luxury. Not so different, perhaps, than the celebrity we see the, seeing, wearing the, the bright diamonds brilliantly sparkling on his or her necklace. But for a king, a crown is more than just wealth and luxury. It is a sign of his power and of his greatness. And when our God wants us to understand his greatness, what truly makes him remarkable, he doesn't point to the great miracle of his creator, creation and his creative power, nor does he point to the end at the great judgment he said, says is coming at the end of all time. He points to you. He points to me, his people. The ones he has made is owned by faith. He points to sincere, to, to sinners who are declared righteous by his grace. Do you see, do you see these humble and ordinary people? I have lifted them up out of their sins. I have cleansed and washed them of their offenses. I have dressed them in my own love and perfection and that of my only son. I have adopted them adopted them as my very own and claimed them to be members of my royal family. That's the righteousness God wants the world to see. The righteousness he puts on display, 
a righteousness provided by him and expressed in the new names that he has given to his people. But what's the new names? We, we, we had a reference to it just a moment ago. He says, you'll be given a new name, but we haven't heard it yet. Now comes the reveal. And with that reveal, we see that there is more coming along with it. Now, the Lord gives new names to his people to express his delight in them. You will no longer be called deserted and your land will not be called desolate. Instead, you will be called my delight is in her. And your land married, for the Lord delights in you and your land will be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so your sons will marry you. And as a groom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. We haven't talked yet much about the context of Isaiah's words 2,700 years ago. Um, a little context, I believe, will help us with the pictures. Uh, Isaiah is a, a prophet of the exile in Babylon, although he lived 100 years before that event. God used him to warn his people about what was coming. They were going to go into exile because of their unfaithfulness. That, that Babylonian exile was God's disciplinary response to the way his own people had behaved. They had deserted God. In spite of the fact that of all the nations of the world, they were the only people who had a God who really actually exists and who actually got involved in their own lives and made a difference. But at the same time, of all the nations of the world, they seemed to be the, the one people they didn't like the God that they had. But they were willing to trade him for almost any other. So because Israel had deserted the Lord, the Lord now said that he was going to desert them. He was no longer going to bring his miraculous deliverances to his people when Babylon invaded. When they put, uh, were put in chains and, and marched off to Babylon, their own country, their own land became desolate empty, alone. And so for 70 years, uh, the terms deserted and desolate, well, those are fitting names to describe this people in their country. But the names were temporary. The Lord does not stop loving his people even when they rebel against him. From the beginning, he intended to restore them and to bring them home and to have them close to him again as his very own. That meant new names were in order. You will be called my delight is in her. Well, that's a single word in the Hebrew, Hephzibah. It's been used as a name even among us in the perhaps deeper past. Read the novel Silas Marner sometime. And the description for the country, where now the people had been brought home and, and land and people were, were, were not uh, apart any longer and the land was not lonely and desolate but occupied, he says the name there, the land will be called married or, or Beulah in the Hebrew. Those pictures... Those names are more than a reminder of a happy reunion. As a groom rejoices over his bride, so your God will rejoice over you. The Lord has not forgiven our sins and brought himself back to us and us back to him as a mere business transaction. Sometimes we can dig so deep into the terminology and discussion of forgiveness and grace, justification and sanctification, sacrifice and substitution, righteousness and holiness, that it may begin to seem to us uh, as though this is all merely religious theory. And we can follow along and understand the, the uh, abstract theology well enough to even to be able to believe it. But it may seem to us as though it's a little dry, as though God's relationship with us was nothing more than a client on the other side of a contract. 
That is not how the Lord sees a relationship. Though it literally cost him his lifeblood to establish it, uh, for him, every day he has you is like his wedding day. It fills him with great passion and excitement just to have you as his own, just to go through life with you and to do life together. He never gets tired of it. He wants nothing more than to go through all eternity looking at you and listening to you and talking to you. The joy and excitement of that shared life will never fade. There's not going to be any seven-year itch or even seven-million-year itch because you are the people in whom he delights and his names, Hephzibah and Beulah, are there to remind us that it is so. Couples who are in love, whether married or merely dating, often have pet names for each other, don't they? They call each other things like honey, darling, sweetie, pumpkin. Maybe we even feel a little awkward sometimes when we are overhearing their terms of endearment. God's love for you is something more than a mere human affection or romantic love, but it is not something less. And in the intimacy of saving faith, he has given you new names because he's proud to call you his very own. Amen. Please stand.